Welcome, Mr. Shore and Mala Magashi, and thank, thank you for, you for saying there. yes to our invitation to join this town hall. Thank you. We appreciate your time. Now, a few things to note before we start. In addition to people in the room who will be asking questions of the candidates we have here today, we have six remote locations across Nigeria's six geopolitical zones in six Nigerian universities. And over the course of the next two hours, we will hear from all of them. We've also collated questions sent to us via email and our social media platforms. And we'll try and get answers to as many of them as possible from our two candidates. Finally, we will also try and take live questions from these platforms. It is also important that people asking questions state their names clearly and be on point, as we must be mindful of time and ensure that we get as many people as possible to be part of the conversation. Now, without wasting any more time, I'd like to dive straight in. This is your second attempt to you know, um, convince the Nigerian electorate that they should make you president. Has anything changed, particularly in the message um, that you are bringing to the electorate, given that four years has elapsed since you, ran co you last contested? Yes. I want to say good evening to Nigerians and uh, everyone watching all over the world. I was a candidate for the African Action Congress in the 2019 election. And in those days, there were several other younger candidates who contested with me uh, on the opposite side of the context. And uh, of course, a number of uh, our ancestors also contested in that uh, election. But I would say that I was the only candidate who never stopped campaigning, because shortly after the 2019 elections, I started a movement, a revolution now, which was to deal with the election irregularities and bring to the attention of Nigerians the need to focus towards a total liberation for the people of the country, because elections had failed them. I wanted to disagree with you, and I will disagree with you, that I lost the election. You cannot lose what did not happen. That election was totally a fraudulent election, and it was an election in which numbers were allocated to us, the other candidates. And, and, then and the many winner who, was assigned there, by... There are many who would argue that actually what you did was unethical because you ran for an election, and when you lost it, you decided that you were going to start a revolution. The most ethical thing that any human being can do is to aspire towards liberation. And you cannot allow your oppressors to limit your liberation agenda by conforming with their rules and laws and regulations on how to conduct your struggle for total liberation. Okay, so let me ask a quick question. Now that you are contesting again, is it because you are now convinced that the process has been sanitized and that you will get free and fair elections? No, before a revolution happens, a number of or a series of events must happen. And part of our struggle is to get a system to give way so that our people can have a fresh list of life. Yes, the Explain, system please. that is uh, putting our people in bondage. And in most cases, because we are peaceful and also very so a revolution is not a violent revolution. It has never been designed as a re violent revolution. It is the oppressors that determine the nature and character of revolutions anyways. So based on that experience of four years ago and where we are today, is your messaging changing? Is what you are offering to Nigerians different? Um, how are you going to try and ensure that you have a different outcome this time around? The messages have not changed because the objective conditions of Nigerian people haven't changed. As a matter of fact, things got worse That's what after I was about 2019. To say, yeah. The only difference in our message is the urgency of now, and that people should understand that this next election is a make or my election. And I know people hear that all the time, but I've always said, and I'll repeat here, that Nigeria is living on borrowed times. And these elections, if they do not encompass the wishes, aspirations, and the desires of Nigerian people to see a different path in terms of governance, uh, that revolution you are running away from is upon we'll you. OK, and, and I, I will get an opportunity to dive into what it is specifically you're offering Nigerians. We'll look at your manifesto. Are you going to ask again things. after you knew that on <laughs> But I wanted an opportunity for you to perhaps um, get, to, to get to know your running mate, because you've, you've changed your running mate yes. from the last person. That I changed from a doctor to a lawyer. Right. Why? 
because there will be a lot of we'll prosecutions. <laughs> <laughs> so you are, you are expecting him to help with the legal... As, absolutely. Yeah. So, yes, Madam Mogeshi, lovely to meet you. Um, Thank you. For the first time. But I, I'm just wondering, what is it about this particular party that made you decide you wanted to pitch your tent with the party and also Mr. Shore? Yeah. I've been a lawyer for the past 17, 18 years. And uh, all through, I've been human rights activist to the extent that I hold human rights cases for Mr. Femi Falana, the renowned human rights lawyer, most decorated human rights lawyer in Africa. So I am struggling to hear you, and I'm wondering whether that is the case with people in the room, and I just wanted to sort of call the attention of the technical people. Um, I, I'm, you know, because there's no point having a conversation if people can't. We will so accuse if, you of... Uh, bias, <laughs> I know. Certainly, certainly. <laughs> so certainly. please, can we, can we get someone to sort of um, sort out the volume issues we seem to be having? Maybe you could help me by raising your voice while they try to sort it out. I'm sorry I interrupted. But okay. it's better you get heard. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. That's the most important thing. Yes. Uh, I, I'm saying uh, since I became a lawyer, mm -hmm. I've been running human rights campaigns, actually. I'm a, an activist. I got to the extent that I hold cases for Mr. Femi Falana, the most decorated human rights lawyer in Africa, mm -hmm. in the northern part of uh, Nigeria, particularly Kasena Kanos and other that exist. So uh, this party, African Action Congress, has shown itself that it is an avenue that fight for the masses, right. that fight for the human rights of the masses, actually. So, it runs along the line that I do. Your Therefore, convictions. Yes, I'm convinced yeah. that joining the party and joining the politics will help and uh, uh, that fight for the human rights of the masses, actually. So it runs along the line that I do. Your Therefore, convictions. Yes, I'm convinced yeah. that joining the party and joining the politics will help and... Uh, uh, raise the standard of the uh, activism I do. Mm -hmm. So I am still uh, in the legal activism, human rights activism, and a politician. And a politician now. Okay. And and I was going to wait to ask you um, this question, but because it has sort of come up, I think I would dive straight into it before going into policy. He mentioned doing work with Mr. Femi Falona. Yes. I'm um, someone who we all, you know feel was your long-time supporter. Him, as well as one or two other people like Deli Fasoronti, who were sort of known to be your supporters, seem to have sort of shifted their allegiance to um, the Labour Party. Um, do you think this is going to have any bearing on um, your ability to win elections or the way you even run them, given that these are sort of big figures with big names? Well, I've uh, been in touch with Femi Falano up till yesterday. Mm. And I also heard him speak on a TV show last week. And he said he has not endorsed the Labour Party. Right. He's a lawyer to the Nigeria Labour Congress. That is not the same thing as being a lawyer to the Labour Party or supporting mm. the candidate of the Labour Party. So you want to check your record. Mm. Uh, but with regards to Dele Faro Dele Timi, has come yes, out to openly say that. I actually never met Dele Faro Timi until I came out of detention. Right. Uh, but we realized that he was at the Lagos State University and I was at Junilag when we were fighting for democracy. Which is right mm. to decide who he would choose for election. And he made it very clear, in all fairness to him, that his own position is not driven by ideology. Mm. That is driven by the need for fairness. He believes that a Southeasterner should be the president of Nigeria at this time. Okay. Yes. And now that we sort of set the foundation for yes. that, I'll ask one question and then we will open it up to the audience because, again, it's a town hall. It's not a Q&A between yourself and I. Uh, my first question is to ask you, given the sort of economic issues Nigeria is facing at the moment, do you have any sort of underlining principle, philosophy, strategy um, that sort of forms um, the thrust of the policies you will pursue to solve our economic issues if we elect you as president? Yes. And our policy, first and foremost, ideologically, we are on the socialist side of things. So we believe that the people of Nigeria should be the beneficiary of Nigeria's resources, now not a few. And uh, secondly, it is that we believe that an economic system that we have been running, especially since the 80s, which is driven by 
the Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank and the IMF and their likes, is not the right way to go because that's what ruined our industries. These are the economic policies that put us where we are today. We want to change course and direction with regards to that. The reason is that I have exposure. I know that there is no IMF policy in the United States of America where IMF offices are based. There must be a reason why they don't want them to be operating within the country. Just as you are not likely to find a VOA station mm. and cable in the US, but Africans are all over the place listening to VOA because these are propaganda outlets for them to advance their own foreign policy intentions. So we will change course completely. Mm. And the other part is, of course, change of personnel. In coming to government, you are not going to have a central bank of Nigeria that's a glorified uh, bureau the change. And, and I think because we need to sort of dig deep into sort of the specifics of what you are doing, yes. I will take a small break, yes. allow others to join this conversation first, and then we can dive into the details if they don't come up in the course of answering questions from our audiences. So um, we start with the people in the hall. Anyone who has a question, could you please introduce yourself and then ask your question? And we start, yeah, the, the man in yellow, yes, please. All right. Um, I greet my potential uh, president and potential VP, uh, Moses Adebayo. I know you to be a radical. Um, I'm more really sure, eh? but you're in okay, I'm right going now. to ask you, you to just ha hang on a minute. Could you do a favor for me? There's a bit of an echo, so drop the mic down. All right. Uh, and an then hand. speak, yes. So please. Um, I welcome you to my world, Mr. Shubre. You need me now. Um, and you have to convince me why I shouldn't or should vote for you. Babangida and his policy, sir, practically destroyed the middle class. I'm a product, a very proud product of the middle class. Not very rich, but not too poor. But what will you do radically, since that's your very nature, to bring about that bridge again? Because in our world today, Nigeria is just a case of extremes. Um, the minimum wages, let me use that euphemism now, for those downtrodden, and the maximum wages. How do we bring about a middle class that will always be the lifeline of any thriving economy? You think of South Korea, you think of Singapore. Their middle class is the lifeblood of the economy. So what will you do to ensure that the middle class is back and Nigeria economy is restored? Thank you. Thank you. So the middle class, we'll take maybe two more before we come back to the candidates because it's just more efficient. Anybody else? Not yet? Okay. Maybe we dive into that question. Yes. You know, the middle class already left. Because one of the things they did to Nigeria was to ruin the middle class. Mm -hmm. So we now have only two classes left. Those who are left behind, who have nowhere to go, can't figure out where to go, and those who own the country. And my Where duty, do you belong? I, I belong? Because if I look at sort of objectively, yes. you don't fit into either, right? I don't so. fit into any because, of course, uh, we are special classes of people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who is now, you know, we are not, we're, we're everywhere except uh, at the top right. because we're always with the masses. But the most important thing here is that Nigeria's main problem is that all of us deal with a pie. And the pie also has for two classes, you know, is, and the higher class, we do socialism for them, you know, we give them waivers, they earn maximum wage, they get special uh, interest rates. They get even special exchange rates in this country. And for the, the lowest class, there's nothing for them. We pay them minimum wage. And you see in Nigeria, even when you talk their own economics, they calculate fiscal policy through the macroeconomic system they put in place. They talk about monetary policy, which is exchange rate, central bank. And then there's one policy in microeconomics they never talk about, and that is the purchasing power parity which is what exactly determines the well-being of the populace. Mm -hmm. And that is where the middle class actually st stays. So, so in specific terms, what how would you What it means is that, upon that, is first and foremost to restore things that will make the country start working, the energy sector, the manufacturing sector, you know, uh, get the security situation under control through several means, you know, the physical intervention, so, so, so is, then we, the economic we, intervention, we, You need to tell security. us in specific, we are I'm now giving, here for you I to break it down. I am giving you specifics now. Okay. You know, the specific you probably never hear from the other candidates you'll okay. be speaking for uh, with after today. It is for us to get back to work. I want to put electricity to start working in this country. And if we have 24-7 electricity, 
you will grow the GDP by, I, I think economists will be worried as to how to calculate that. If you how? do that, you will, of course, improve security as well. And you can bring manufacturing back, like my friend was saying about I, the structural I adjustment just program them. that just prepared Nigeria uh, to be a dumping ground for Yele, manufacturers. I'm not interrupting for the sake of interrupting. Yes. I want us to take these things as you talk about them yes. one by one. Let's start with electricity. Yes. Um, government tried to run our electricity, yes. decided that it didn't work, unbundled it, kept transmission, and privatized distribution and generation. People argue corruption within the system, the way the privatization was done. There's a whole lot of reasons why people think that didn't work. Yes. What will you do differently that would give Nigeria you power? See, if government hadn't privatized electricity, it would be difficult to make the argument that we need to renationalize our electrical grids. They are so important you can't give it to people who are Bukaneers. What has happened to all our electricity uh, so you will nationalize Absolutely. We are taking distribution, it back. We are the ones still, generation? Absolutely. We are the ones still funding the privatized. You were talking about uh, generation. Generation is also largely privatized. Yes, but the only what, thing that isn't privatized is transmission. Exactly. So what do you think happens? You sell to them government built uh, generating power stations. You sell to them at giveaway prices. You still have to give them waivers to import whatever they want to import. You still have to give them bank guarantees, government guarantees. You still have to get the CBN to give them grants okay. to do what they And yet, you are in darkness. The government previous to this one spent $60 billion, you know, trying so, to fix the electrical system. Okay, they so can't. The you, one if, next, if you take it back yes. and renationalize it, yeah. how do you solve the problems that made privatization look attractive at the time that government decided they were going to privatize Because power. government was just doing trial and error. That's why they were in charge of it at the point, and later they privatized it. They sold it to their friends. Are you dismissing the lack of efficiencies, the tendency and to that's, corruption? That's, reason, that's what I'm talking about. One of the things I said when we started this is we're changing personnel. I'm going to be president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, not the people who don't know what they are doing. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be the chief hiring officers for the best human resources you can find on it, who are Nigerians, who will come back and make it happen here for us. Okay. So we have, the, we have the people already who can make this country work. We keep making it sound like we don't have Nigerians who can make things work. But when you sell electricity generating plants to Nigerian big men with their big political connections, then they go and import uh, Indians. What I'm they go hearing and import is... Palest I mean, uh, Philippines. Uh, what, what? And you say, <laughs> what, what is there? What, what, what is there that we cannot do? Why did we have to? Why did we have a country that is 60, okay. 60 What I'm hearing years is a program of mass sackings. If you ever nobody is sacking become... anybody. It was privatization that led to the unemployment you are talking about okay. now. And, and all will... the companies owned by the Nigerian government working and yes. not privatized, people will be, a lot of people will be employed today. Government would have employed more people in those factories. Okay. But, but the will... people who you are subsidizing, hmm. who you are giving grants, who you are giving. Uh, 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 waivers. How is it that they have not been able to provide more people getting employed? Or instead, they go and bring outsiders to come and run businesses that can be run okay. in Nigeria. Somebody will go you, to the Niger Delta okay, bring but, a, Philippine, but, but, a Filipino in the history, to come and be doing underwater Mr. Jory, welding. When there you, are people you know in the Niger that, Delta who, okay. who sleep inside water. Before we go to break, I just... <laughs> Before we go for a break, I just wanted to share a little fact with you, and then we'll go on a break and we'll continue Thank when we you. come back. Um, in the history of Nigeria, electricity generation peaked for the first time to over 5,000 megawatts September this year. Did you know that? It was rainy season. Why not? No, but it had never happened before. No, it, it happened. So when you, when you dismiss, let's, let's, let's make I'm it clear. I'm saying even when... Let's make it clear. It was not privatization that made it peak. Okay. It was that the rainy season was very But we've long. had rainy seasons for the last 60 years. Let the years. rainy season be over and tell me, you have capacity to generate okay. 7,000 megawatts of electricity. You are transmitting 5,000, and you want me to celebrate that. What happened to the last 2,000? No, I'm not asking you to celebrate. I'm no, just telling I'm, you I'm it's the highest it has ever been. Part. Rainy season comes, electricity goes up. Our electricity is based on hydropower generation, largely, because we haven't been able to get gas to fire all the gas fires. Okay, I, I'm going to have to ask you to um, allow us to take a quick break. When we come back, we carry on delving a little bit further into what you intend to do with the economy and perhaps get to hear a little bit more from Malam Bagashi. Um, don't go away, you're watching The Candidates.
New Central TV, Africa's number one storyteller, has come with the best of both worlds. With a combination of news app and live TV, we ensure that you keep track of the latest headlines, breaking news, and in-depth analysis from professional journalists from around the continent. Download the New Central TV app on Android and iOS and get started today. Don't forget to follow us on New Central's social media platforms. New Central, Africa first. Welcome back. You are watching The Candidates, a Daria Media Town Hall series brought to you with the support of the MacArthur Foundation and in partnership with the Nigeria Television Authority, Cabal Entertainment, YouTube, New Central, Citizen Zukoko, Network Service of Radio Nigeria, and Emmanuel Chapel. Now, let us um, join one of our remote locations. Let's go to the University of Ibadan where Nero is on standby to help us with um, engagement with the candidates. Hello, Nero. Hello, Kadurea. How are you doing? I can see that it's really yeah. getting interested in the studio there. Okay, let's he go straight can't hear so Nero, we so we can see him. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, we can't hear him here in the hall, so the candidates need to be able to hear him. Okay. Can you hear me now? Um, can you hear that, Mr. Shore? No, very well. No, he can't, he can't hear, so... Okay. All right. Um, while they're sorting that problem out so that we don't waste time, um, are there questions in the studio in here? No? Okay. Oh, there's a question. Okay. Please tell us your name and ask your question. Yes. My name is Fomi Inouye Jekwe. I'm a broadcast journalist. My question, oh, sorry. My question to you is, give us three points, because even with the power question, for example, you haven't told us how. You've gone back to tell us a problem, or, but even when it was in the public sector, when I was growing up, there was up NEPA, so even in the public time, and when it was not privatized, we still had power issues. So tell me three points now, how you're going to solve the insecurity issue in Nigeria, currently. Specifics they're looking for. Yeah. Um, first, we must understand what is driving insecurity in Nigeria. It's because people have not had opportunity over these years. We haven't invested in our people. And we now have people who are completely cut out of the benefits of existence and citizenship in this country. And so to solve the, power, I mean, the security problem, first and foremost, people must think beyond just the idea of shooting at people who are terrorists or bandits. Understand that Nigeria's security problem have you know, various dimensions to it. If you look at the map of Nigeria, you look at the northeast, the reason is terrorism. The northwest has banditry. You go down, there's militancy. You go to the east, there's insurgency. And then there's general crime. But the biggest insecurity facing Nigeria are government officials who are fueling poverty and engaging in corruption, because that's how we got here in the first place. Mm. But for me to solve it first and foremost, and I'm sorry to say this on national TV, if it requires bringing in mercenaries into Nigeria just to end the kind of biting insecurity we have now so that people can even have a chance to sleep and rest at night, I'll do it. That's number one. Okay, the so second is to start rebuilding our military and security agencies. I'm sitting with three days ago, I was sitting with all the major security agencies in this country at the police headquarters in Abuja. And I tell you, one of the most pathetic things I heard from the table, and I'm not going to mention the name of the officer, they were whining over the fact that the U.S. was declaring that there is a, it's, there's going to be attacks in Abuja and uh, it has to do with U.S. politics. And I'm looking at the man and say, why didn't you take action? You are the one who is supposed to tell the U.S. to be ready for evacuation because there's insecurity. But the U.S. is telling you, you kept quiet, and you are here complaining that the U.S. has reasons, extraordinary reasons why they told you that. Because you all have failed. So personnel must also change, and we must so you ensure don't, that... you don't have confidence, is what you're saying, with the current I don't, people running in Nigeria addition, security. And I want to say this. The yes. Nigerian security armed forces do not have a commander-in-chief. That's number one position within our command structure for the, for the security agencies. So she Ours asked for three is, things. We don't have anyone. Mercenaries, you said. Yeah. Um, Rekitting and retooling the army. Including remuneration, retraining, collection right. of intelligence, 
processing of intelligence. But finally, and I must make this clear, mm. without putting a social security system in place, without wiping out or at least reducing inequality, without investing in education, you can't do anything about the security. Have China you? has more guns than Nigerians. What yeah. eventually solved the insecurity problem in China is social investment in their okay. people. They so, have empty so apartments. Have all you over calculated the, the cost of your specific actions, the cost of have, mercenaries, have, the cost of retooling, I have retooling, done that. I have done that. and how you would pay for it? What numbers have you looking at? I have done that, and I've come to the conclusion that it actually costs less to do what I need to do than what is costing us now for doing nothing. For doing nothing. Or doing the wrong thing. Where will you find the money? Wherever they are finding the money to do the nonsense they are doing now. She's stealing. <laughs> you understand? Okay. okay. Um, before I go to the quick remote location, Madam Magashi, you are from the north. And of course, we, we now have um, um, the, the northwest has become a basket case, just like the northeast, because of the kidnappings. We've seen the, the, the pastoralist clashes, etc., etc. As someone who's sort of living that life, you know, surrounded by people who are facing insecurity, is there anything more that you would encourage your party to do, or you within your party you are discussing, in addition to what uh, Mr. Shoure has said he would do? Yes, there is. Okay. I have said this before. These in, uh, insurgents, kidnappers, bandits, where have they come from? From the very society, from our community, they did not cross the border and settle in Nigeria and started uh, shooting people anyhow and stealing people. So it is very important for a government to understand the nature of the society. What is the cause of this insurgency? What is the cause of this banditry? Uh, in recent days, we have seen two incidences. Let me mention them. One of the bandits, King Fins, was turbaned as a traditional ruler in Zamfara State. He came to the palace, he was turbaned, he uh, offered an interview to some specific journalists. Another incident is that recently the uh, infamous Belo Turji, which is the uh, most common name of our bandits, he came to the town uh, and attended a wedding, wedding fatia of a relative of his. Mm. After he left, there was an attack and uh, he lost uh, some relatives, actually. So if these bandits, these terrorists, have roots in our society, they communicate with our people. They these terrorists have roots in our society. They communicate with our people. They interact with our people. I believe the government needs to come to the community, mm. get to the root of these people, and understand why are they into this, and propose solutions to that. Okay. Let's, let's um, quickly run to um, the... Because I, I'm really keen that we get all six places to talk to the candidates that we have here. I don't want it to become uh, an interview. Ibadan, we're coming to you. Nero, good evening. Can you hear us now? Yeah, Niron's, Niron's mic, which is so, Ibadan was so crystal clear yesterday. What's happening to Ibadan? We can't hear him in here. Okay, let's go straight to Bayero University, Kano. Can Kano hear us? Today we seem to have Just big technical to, problems. To I apologize for that. Okay, audience questions? For Mr. Shogore? Yes, None? Lady. Ah, there's, there's, yes. Good evening, Mr. Shogore and um, Dr. Magashi. Thank you. <laughs> uh, my name's uh, one for Christian I find from the disabilities uh, communities here in Lagos. Uh, my question is, sir. Uh, if you become the president of Nigeria come 2023, what are your programs you know, in terms of um, social protection for people with disabilities in this country and um, your agendas for the inclusion of PWDs in your governance? Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I want to thank you for coming here today. 
And one thing I've hated so much about Nigeria is that, this, you know, people with disabilities, people we call special population, have always been used as a signboard for, you know, occasional intervention. But look at what you guys give to this country in terms of pride in the Olympics. You are the ones who have likely won the most gold in this country. But when, after we collect the gold from you and we do the paparazzi as usual, we abandon you. Let's start thinking about policy. I've never seen a government boss in this country that has a ramp for this, you know, people with disability to get into the bus or get up. Not even a federal government building has a ramp that I know of for you. So part of our social security policy is to ensure that all of you are known and well documented and are given the support you need to survive in our society. What I mean is that not only do you deserve cash transfers on a regular basis, in fact, on a two-weekly basis is what I would recommend, but you need to have opportunities to go to schools wherever <laughs> you want to go to school, and ensure that a great percentage of your own population and representation in the country is also assigned to you in terms of existence in government and places that government have investments. Not that we'll say, well, there's another, maybe they'll probably plan another ministry of uh, disability so that a person who doesn't have any, any of these concerns or challenges will be the head of the place. Mm -hmm. So let's have a ministry, I mean, you know, several policies that makes you feel like, okay, so let me... make, you, make you whole again, be part of Nigerian society in a way that we don't treat you as if you are not part so of let us me, or let you me... just need occasional intervention. Uh, let, let, yes. Before you do, yeah. in 2019, yes. um, the candidates was um, instrumental in getting uh, President Muhammadu Buhari to actually sign the disability law um, so that they now actually have you know, a legal framework for yeah. rights for people with disability. I'm wondering whether you are familiar with that law and if you have any criticism of it as it currently exists. No, I've not, I've not read the law. Okay. And I treat everything done by President Buhari with the same attention lack of attention, because I know he may not have even read the law he signed himself. Right. We see him doing that all the time. I'm talking about what I would do, mm. not what they have been doing. Yeah, but if, if you already have doing, an existing no, law, if they, if, surely if, if what they were you have doing responsibility as of, to if, familiarize yourself If there's with a law in place yes. that promotes inclusion of PWD, it's a special population like she's talking about, she won't be here complaining, right? If the laws were working in your own interest. Yes. So it's apparent that that law is inadequate and insufficient, okay. and I'm not going to be basing my own future policy okay. on laws made by Buhari. Mal <laughs> Malam, Magas, you wanted to say a few things. See, I had a glimpse of that law, and uh, it is uh, a bit inadequate. It needs to be improved. It is a good thing that it is in place, right. but it is inadequate. Okay. I work along with uh, an organization uh, with the persons with disability in the north, and uh, my chamber in Kano has offered to uh, uh, has uh, suggested to offer free legal services to people with disability in the event of anything that comes right. as a result of, uh, of their position or in the enforcement of the provisions of that law. And that uh, agreement is still there. Right. Thank you very much for that. Um, any more questions before we try to hit one of the remote locations again? People in the audience? Okay. Uh, right, there's a, a lady in white. Mr. Shore. My name is Rabbi Isma. You need to take off your mask, perhaps, because you're muffled. We can't hear you. No, we, we, we can't hear her. So I'm going to, while they're trying to sort that out, um, we're going to Bayero University, Kano, who are ready for us. Bayero. Good evening, and welcome to Bayero University, Kano. My name is Stephen Enoch. From the studio... We, we can see him, but again, we can't hear him of... in here. Can you hear me? There, there's a problem with the sound in the actual studio. We can't hear him. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Let's 
deal with other things while we're waiting for them to sort out that technical problem so that we don't... Um, on the issue of um, insecurity, for example, there are many people who say that the decentralization of our security apparatus um, contributes to our inability to respond. And one of the issues that come up repeatedly when people talk about restructuring um, is that maybe we need some sort of community policing, state policing. I know that you're not comfortable with that. Why is that not a consideration for you um, when it comes to trying to solve our security problems? Why is bringing policing closer to the people not an option? No, I've never said I'm not uh, interested in community policing. I, I've always said that I believe that there is not enough community intervention in policing. Right. And that I will sign up not only on state policing, campus policing, local government policing. So I misread yes, what's Yes, you must yeah, have okay. yes. Town policing. I live in a place in the U.S., a small town of less than 3,000 people. They have a police uh, department, and they have about seven vehicles. There might be more. So, so state so, police controlled by states and community police controlled by communities? Yes, because we have three tiers of government in Nigeria. Right. We have the local government, I mean, we have local government, states, and federal. There's need for federal police, no doubt, mm. but federal police cannot enforce laws that are state laws. Most of the laws, including, I think, murder uh, in, in Nigeria, are state laws. So yeah. the states are the owners of the laws that need to be prosecuted when an offender uh, is involved. But the police that is involved is not controlled by the states. Right. So I'm in support of state police. But let me expand further that not only do I sus uh, subscribe to that, but that the Nigerian constitution is one of the biggest problems at this point when it comes to foundational issues like this. And that, that 1999 constitution as a fraudulent document written by some military uh, uh, brass. But factually, that's wrong. That people keep repeating that it was no, written not, by the military. No, it's not factually wrong. No, no, no. no, no. no. Maybe, the, for people, the, the, maybe the for people who did not understand no, military no, rule no, or who didn't we, we, we fight the military. We have a lawyer. Let me tell him my understanding of the Constitution and he what can tell me. What is your own understanding of the Constitution? My understanding of the Constitution we yes. run is yes. that it is primarily based on the 1979 Constitution. And that 79 Constitution was actually put together by a team it's that a was... It's assembly. Yeah, but yeah. they were all civilians, led yeah. by FRC Williams. Yeah. But and that was what was Williams. adopted no, and adjusted. No, so so, so, so what when I'm people keep talking about a military uh -huh. constitution, it's how very misleading. There it's were it's no a military soldiers. constitution because a constitution must be promulgated into they existence. They do not have the mandate of yeah, Nigerians people. to adopt the constitution. So why it's fraudulent is the preamble. We, the people of Nigeria, any book you see that tells such a lie, Brazen lie. So the people who put it together it were, were representative of Nigeria. No, from all indications, did. they were not military people. They were military people. They no, did. They it was promulgated by a decree. Yes, but it wasn't put together by soldiers. It was put together they by put soldiers. Together to the point that, and to people the point that the was going to be sworn in in uh, 1999. They don't have a copy available because they were still looking we for need, printers. Okay. This, and this, this, another this, thing, yes. No, no let no, me finish. No, no, let me finish. No, 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 no. That constitution, let me tell you, let mm. me tell you this, and I'm going to ask you to do your research. Yes. That 99 constitution was so bad yes. that a portion of it was found to mention America in it because it was copied from, part of it was copied from the U.S. Constitution. That is they not to my understanding. I have that. never heard this. Well, I don't know my understanding. There are a lot of things you don't know that I know. That's why I'm running for president. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The, the things that are on the record yes. officially about... But this is um, with, all, with all seriousness, the things yeah. that are um, on the We're record... serious. So no, what no, I'm saying let, is that let, if, let, you let, want, let, if you want all these great things justice, for restructuring to be justice, put in that Nikki constitution... Justice, Toby... Yeah was the person charged, is his committee that put together that constitution. My understanding of the way it worked is that they went around the country, took a lot of input from multiple Which, yeah. stakeholders. We're talking about 1999 came, constitution now. Yes, came not, back not and recommended. Yeah, no, 79 was Nikki put together. Toby, you are Nikki, mixing up things. No, no. Nikki Toby. You are mixing up no, things. So. And you know what you are doing, the the You know exactly assembly. what you are doing. No. The, Nikki Toby was the chairman of the Constituent Assembly put up by Obasan Job, if I'm right that was supposed to make a constitution. And they came back and said but that's what that the consensus constitution. was 79 with amendments. No, and I that was what with was you. passed and what we now use. Anyway, should have we will not... Fact checkers here. So, that will, we so, 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 so you, you want a new constitution, a brand new constitution? Brand new, yes. 
how are you going to achieve this? The people of Nigeria deserve one. And it is their own I, wish I'm that is about, paramount. I'm asking about the how. Yes. People all, want a lot of things. All these the other issue other is the how. All these other presidents of Nigeria have tried to create a constitution. The reason they didn't come into existence is because it did not satisfy their own personal interests. Obasanjo did it, but he wanted it for third term. When it didn't happen, they threw it out of the window. Mm. Jonathan did it. He wanted seven years, ten instead of the usual four years. When it didn't work, 2004. That, that's the uh, well. Yes, that's a claim. They we threw it out of the window. Mm. We can if. It is the consensus of the people. If the people want a new constitution, the, the people then, because have, the, where, the where people I'm going, have where representation I'm going, in the National Assembly. Please, they do. Where I'm going is that the National Assembly have been amending the constitution. If they was working, we wouldn't be talking about constitutional amendments. But you see, even lawyers say it. I think it's a Latin word that you can't build something on nothing. Mm. The guy who is in charge of the amendment of the Nigerian constitution in the National Assembly. Is the one they caught in London trying to uh, sell kidney. So, the, the because point, he has the point, no, you, we're using you, it to I'm make sorry, money. I'm, you know, I don't have millions to settle libel. And, 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 no, 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 seriously. No, no, no seriously. No, no. seriously. This, this is not libel. You have to be really careful libel. about it. No, 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 seriously. I, I don't have. The guy in charge of constitutional amendment in the National Assembly for the longest time is yes. a Kuremadu. Senator well, Kuremadu. Okay, so if you are calling And it's also a fact that he's jailed in London. Because he's not jailed. He's, 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 he's been sitting, tried. He's sitting we need in, to be he's very careful. In London, he hasn't been, been found tried. guilty. I'm, he's been we charged. We can use jail with a and crime. detention interchangeably. No, no, no. This so, is the law. No, but, but if it's true, the but that is not that no, going no, trial no, for trying no, to take no, no. Charging somebody is That's why I'm telling you that you are wasting your time trying to amend the constitution using the Nigerian okay. National so Assembly. So let, let me focus on your vice president, who is also a lawyer, right? And, and, and I just want to try and find out that the reason I'm asking about how you intend to do this is that even if um, you do go ahead and win the elections yeah. like you're trying to do, you're contesting, it is possible. Given the, you know, uh, footsteps of AAC across the country, it is very unlikely that you have a majority in the National Assembly. So unless you're saying to me, you're going to be dictatorial, the question that I'm asking is valid about how you are going to convince members of the enough. National Assembly yeah. who have tried to do just constitutional amendments without luck because they couldn't get the unanimity they need in sort of state houses of because assembly, etc. So something how, on nothing. how are I'm you going you. to convince this same set of people to change your constitution? Okay. Do you want to hear from me, or you want to hear from me? I think me? I want to hear from him, then we'll okay. come back to you, All right. if that's okay. The first step is to have constitutional conference, where... But we've had many before. So there's nothing original about the idea of a constitutional conference. If you are setting a constitution, at least this 1999 constitution was not a product of any constitutional conference. You can, can keep going back and forth. Okay, I'm listening. Certainly. So you need a constitutional conference where every segment of Nigeria would be participated, would be represented. With that, if you have all what it takes and you come up with a document that is a real representation of the people, then that is when you present it to the assembly for ratification, uh, probably a lot of some few things may be checked and unchecked. Then the next process is having it gone round to the state assemblies. If you have all that, then the constitution would be adopted as a people's constitution. I'm sure you can see I'm smiling. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm smiling is that there are people listening to you and will say, clearly you've never been in government and you don't understand the that's difficulty what people say. That's what people of say. consensus. That's because the, we've seen people try to do this throw, again and they again. They it isn't around because they've never, and I understand this about Nigerians. Right. You've never seen or had, a, or had a set of leaders or any leader that make things work for you. So the standards are very low. Very low. Mm -hmm. So you've never seen anybody that made something work from nothing. I have done it before. I studied geography at the University of Lagos, graduated six years later, traveled to America, had a master's degree in master's in public policy. I did not work for more than two years. I started a global website. Never written before as a journalist. So when I'm telling you that I can make things happen in this country, mm -hmm. I can make it happen. I'm one of the few young people in this country when most of these presidential candidates that are going around now, when they were hiding under their bed and saying that the military leaders of our time should transmute into civilian leaders, following them or that they should never leave power, we said we would deliver democracy into this country. I was 22 years old. 
I made it happen 10 years later, not by myself alone, but by. So there are people who have the mind, the courage, the composure to see into the future and know that a few people can change okay. their world. Okay, so I can, I saying, say yes. can I say something? Can I say something? So when to people that. throw this blackmail at us, I that, know, it's oh, not blackmail. The truth is that the, the truth is that we know from experience yeah. that activism can be determined, driven by one person. But democracy, governance, requires a collective effort. You are never and, and, and this is really where I think many people say you fall short, because you seem to think you can I, do I, things so by many fear. People, many people, people were saying I fall short. In 2019, I was here in front of you in 2019, you guys were laughing at me. The person you elected in 2019 that you were happy about, look at where he puts you now. <laughs> no, it's true. Are you imagine? Okay. Yes. I have to admit, checkmate. Yes. Let, me go, let me go to remote location yes. before Shore kills me. <laughs> uh, Kano is ready, Bayero University. Um, say a few things, please, so we know we can hear you. I, I can see them, but again, uh, I don't know already. what is going on with the audio today. It's been. Public. Can you hear me? We are ah, live we now. We can hear you now. Great. Okay. All right. Good evening and welcome to Bayer University, Kano. My name is Stephen Enoch. Well, from the conversation, it seems Shore has a lot of plans for Nigerians. And students here are curious to ask so many questions. We have Amatola Idris and Hadiza Abubakar. So we'll just take Amatola first and then we'll go to um, Hadiza. Amatu. Good evening. My name is Amatila Idris from Bayer University, Faculty of Law. I have two questions, and my first question goes thus. Some candidates have planned to, commercial, to commercialize the educational sector, especially the tertiary institutions. What are your specific plans to ensure that education is accessible by all Nigerians, irrespective of social class or strata? And my second question is concerning we, the female students of tertiary institutions, regarding to inclusive, um, inclusivity and affirmative action for women. What tools will you employ to ensure that women are actively involved in various sectors of the Nigerian economy? Thank you. We have another question from Hadiza Abubakar. Thank you. My name is Hadiza Yahya Abubakar from Mass Communication Department, Bayer University, Kano. So my own is, when Nigeria closed its borders in August 2019, people were optimistic. We were all hopeful that it might work. However, till date, even though there are, even though proponents believe it's helped in, um, in, curbing, in curbing arms influx. Okay, wait. The ad previous administration, well, sorry, the outgoing administration, they say the aim of that was to protect farmers, reduce arms influx, or to curb arms influx, and at the same time, boost our local production. But till date, we are still in hunger. In fact, the hunger is even increased, unlike before. There is more for the poverty, the level of poverty is very, very high. And at the same time, there were reports that the farmers in the border communities, they, were, they, were, they, were, they became the victims of the, border, of the border closure, which was supposed to protect them. They said report, they said um, security agencies there used to extort them. They extort them saying their produce, their farm produce are no longer permitted. So they extort millions of naira from them. So what I want to know, dear candidates, is, or what we want to know, dear candidates, is if you were elected, what would you do differently in this situation? How will you eradicate hunger? How will you do more good than harm if you were elected? Thank you. Um, Those are the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bayou University. These are extensive questions that I'm sure require detailed answers. And I have just um, a few minutes before the break. So I think what we will do is we will take the quick break, and then when we come back, dive straight into answering those questions. You are watching the candidates. And we are in conversation with the candidates of the AAC. 
Don't go away. Stay with us. New Central TV, Africa's number one storyteller, has come with the best of both worlds. With a combination of news app and live TV, we ensure that you keep track of the latest headlines, breaking news, and in-depth analysis from professional journalists from around the continent. Download the New Central TV app on Android and iOS and get started today. Don't forget to follow us on New Central's social media platforms. New Central, Africa first. Secondary school. The day that school was brought to our village, we built it ourselves, and over 150 kids came out of the bush to go to school mm. that day. That's how some of us so had So you education. will provide free so I'll provide education? Free education. I will fund it. Levels? My own is access and quality for education because the education we don't invest in today is part of why we are dealing with insecurity and crime at the level. I'm not saying that if Will you people rethink are educated, the current education system? Of course. Or you are just going to take what we have and Everything make it Everything has free. to change. You know, the curriculum has to change. I studied geography and planning. Before I knew about the river in my village, I was already known about the five lakes in the U.S. Our <laughs> curriculum is useless. You know, it doesn't focus on getting people educated. It focuses on getting you literate so that you can work for somebody. Right. Yes, I want to put education in education and not just literacy. We need to be literate and educated a lot. And part of the reason why some of the questions we're asking that supposed to is not being up is our level of education. Otherwise, you can know that people who are determined, people who are desirous of freedom and change can change their country. Every country in the world has changed. started with some few people who said, we are going to make it happen. You know that in 1787, uh, mm. you, you will know it from history, that the U.S. has some great men, they call them, some of them slave owners, juries, that wrote the U.S. Constitution. All of us know their names. You don't know the name of the people that wrote the Constitution in 1999. Mm. Because they're even ashamed to come of outside and say that they wrote this we, nonsense. We talked the about it. Guys. So we what I'm saying is that it. great people, great ideas, idealists, ideologues make great okay. country. And, 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 and that's, we are and short I of like that. We are passion, short of that. Show, uh, the last Mr. one, the I last like question the passion, you asked, yes. no, no, we So we need to get through the question because we still women have representation. Yes. Yes. We have been treating women in this country as signage, you know, political parties in particular. Every time there's a rally, women arrive there first with the clothes. They are the ones who will shout and clap. When they are done, they are the ones who clap. But the truth is that women in the current election role, that is the registration of voters, they are 51%. Yes. So practically, women can elect a woman as a president. People, women should stop begging for percentages from people with whom, if you are 50% of voters, why are you accepting 35% mm. of allocation for women? Mm. You know, go for, go for 50% too. Our party, but I, I now want to hear what to you women. will do, not women yes. should do. What will no. you do it's if you I become now, president? Yeah. For me, there's no reason for women to give women allocation of 35%. Let's give them the percentage of their population of the country, or let them take it. Because right. now they have more capacity to even elect leaders than anybody else. So, but, 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 but you know, you, you have to understand, though, there are um, um, cultural... Uh, no, no, the, let me finish yes, now. Uh -uh. As we are talking about so culture they, as if we are not all having, here in the culture. No, no, that's the point I'm making is that there are things that make it difficult for women to take it, like I you understand. say. I understand. And in countries where these things have been taken seriously, representation has actually helped. So if you look at a place like Rwanda, making a conscious decision exactly. to put policy in place, to put laws in place, that's what I want to has do. increased. Yes. So when you say they should just take it, I'm saying that sometimes that's not a practical way it is to practical. deal with these issues. It is practical that if elections are legitimate, that is, if they are free, fair, and credible, that women in this country can elect a woman president. They are 51% of the population. They, they just need a few men. Their husbands, boyfriends, they vote for a guy, he wins the election. So if you have that I want, kind of power, I, I want why it, would you be I begging want, for... Well, you know, we are at a stage where because of education, cultural situations, the any laws, culture, everything. Any culture so that puts what people will in you do yes. if you become president for Nigerian women? I am saying that I will not in any way... So let's start from governors. Yes. You know, so your cabinet, power, what your percentage? Your cabinet is going to be 50, 51% representation. 
okay. the number of women voters, That's percentage of, compared to men. That's right. how we are going to do it. That's the statistics and calculation we are going to use. Okay. Do we have enough, because you, before we go, do we have enough women in our party mm. represented? I'll say no, and I should apologize for that. But that's not the reason for us not to have a clear cut policy that is just and fair towards women. Clear and not be change. using culture as an excuse. Uh, I'm there are rushing you because time, say, time, time. Our culture also time. don't allow men to steal. Why is it that they don't have a problem? <laughs> okay, climate change. There was yes. a question so there. In, and in light of this recent climate flooding, change, yes. a lot of people in this country, for instance, do not understand that one of our biggest crises right now, the Hesman Farmers Clash, started with a climate change issue in the Lake Chad region. The Lake Chad has now dried up to 10% of its size. So the headsmen that used to have a great time around the Lake Chad area, disturbing nobody, they had to move southward. Reason, they are selling beef. Beef is a $4 billion industry in Nigeria. Mm. Particularly in the southwest where we are today, Yoruba people, my people, there's nothing they don't eat when you bring a cow out and slaughter it. The nose, the ass, the legs, you know, everywhere. But the truth is that because we have not applied the policies necessary to regrow, say, the Lake Chad, we are suffering from that mistake because nobody understood it. So how, how, will, you for deal, instance, how will you deal with it? There's a, there's, there's, a, there's a policy we are put in place, you know, to re-energize the Lake Chad region. And part of it, it will surprise you, it's very expensive, mm -hmm. is to direct some of the waters from Lagdo Lake that is flooding Nigeria now. And where will now. you find the money? Why are you always asking about where would we find the money? Because you have to be able to fund things. Where, when we are funding thieves in this country, billions of dollars, they are stealing it. You are asking me where will I find the money when Nigeria has got money. The problem with Nigeria is not that we don't have money. Mm -hmm. It is that it's being shared by a few. If the little money we have is being uh, used appropriately. Uh, Your accountant general will not uh, walk away with uh, 150 billion, billion, and that is not like that. I agree. I'm not disagreeing with that, yes. Shore, but um, if you do become president, I will become president. You will inherit almost from day one some of the issues left behind by these people that you are trying to replace, including yes. empty coffers, at least in the first few days. How are you going to, you know, what are the sort of things that you're going to do to, to find the sort of immediate money that you need. If you go into government today and they say to you, look, we have only one month worth of you know, reserves to import food. And you know, we do a lot of importation of everything we literally consume. You, you know, we don't, we're not selling enough petrol because we're using the rest of it to service debt. These are international obligations that you can't wiggle mm -hmm. out of, you know? How will you deal with that? You see, when I come into saying this authoritatively that I've done my research about money and in 2015 right, right? Um, okay we're going to we're going to have to take a, a quick break because your audio has this time I want to say something good I'm you sorry, will they take can't a break hear you. I'm so sorry they can't hear you. All right. I've just been told by the control room that your mic has gone bad. Okay. And so rather than wasting your time, we take a quick break. And when we come back, you can start again from the beginning, I promise. Let's take a quick break. Association with Cabal Entertainment presents The Candidates, a presidential town hall meeting series where the presidential candidates of the six leading political parties tell us about their plans for the country. Join Kadari Ahmed as she leads us into the world of these candidates from the 17th to the 23rd of November 2022. This very important program will be streamed on FRCN, Radio Now, DSTV, NTA, Facebook, YouTube, and more. This is a time meeting you shouldn't miss. Tune in. Let's hear from the candidates.
Welcome back. You are watching The Candidates, where we're in conversation with the candidates of the AAC, uh, Mr. Showery and Mala Magashi, who want to become president and vice president in 2023 and are asking Nigerians to elect them. Um, I want to recap the question we were dealing with so that, you know, for the sake of those who are just joining us. We were having a conversation, and I was trying to get a sense from you of um, where you would find the resources to do all the things you want to say. And you said Nigeria is a rich country. And the point I was trying to make is that if you were to go into government today, um, there are few things that will happen. You will inherit, for example, a budget that has already been signed. You'll be inheriting all the deficits. You'll be inheriting the debt. And a whole bunch of you know, uh, things that are a little bit messy. And so I think it's a valid question to ask you how you will navigate those things within sort of coming into office. And I'm saying that. Uh, I was one of the presidents that was almost in for handling the responsibility for helping government to look at uh, the use of the money that we had for purchasing now that would have been used to buy a uh, And honestly, the government did recover some of that money, but they were limited. I have done my own research because I will have a transition team that will go to work as soon as the election, I'm declared winner of the election. And I have found over $6.4 billion owed by oil companies to the Nigerian government. When I talked about it, they said they have paid it down to I mean, $2.3 billion now. But that's still solid. The Revenue Mobilization Agency of Government, RMAFC, said there are government agencies, this is not uh, unknown people now, who are refused to return revenues worth 11 trillion naira. Help me add that to 2.1 billion at the change rate of today. You see, my budget is already being balanced. Mm. But, you but, but you can't do all of that until they swear you in in May. No, no, the transition team can reach out to them and say, look, Mr. Ashwara is coming in, please pay up. They don't have up. to listen. Well, if they don't listen... Because you are not president. No, yet. they will listen because they know that I've legitimately been elected as president. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, during uh, when Buhari came in 2015, for the first time publicly, when he thought he had anything to offer, the... What do you mean, Dave? Didn't you campaign I'm, for him? No, I'm talking... I, I didn't run in 2015. But I'm saying the NLNG dropped $4.5 billion Nigeria's dividend publicly for the first time. Mm -hmm to the Nigerian Treasury. And I heard that's how the government started. Since then, they have not dropped any money that we know of publicly. When Less, Shure comes, um, I'm sure they will, get, they will get that message very clearly. So okay. you see that I'm balancing budget. We are not talking about borrowing because Nigeria's problem with debt is not the biggest problem. Our mm. debt to GDP ratio is one of the lowest. Our problem is you know, revenue to GDP. Yep. And we have already discovered where these revenues are leaking and how we can quickly put a lot of money together Would that you, can help uh, when you talk start like the transition. That, one, With regard to the budget, yes. you review it. If it needs that, we send a new supplementary budget to the National Assembly, we will do that. Okay. I want us to dive a little bit, but I think I understand the University of Meduguri might be ready. I'll come back to this budget conversation once we hear from University of Meduguri. University of Meduguri, you are ready or not? Yes, oh. we are ready. Okay. Hello. Yeah, this is Musa Osman from University of Edubri, campus here. And uh, the students are keenly following all the discussions that have been taking, uh, taking place between you and uh, uh, Shawere and his uh, running mate. And we have two students who have uh, some questions to ask. I'll start with Yusuf Tara, who has, who has, who has the first question. Yusuf. Uh, good evening. I, I want to use this opportunity to welcome the AAC presidential aspirant this interactive session. Uh, my name is Saeed Yusuf Tara, and my question goes like this. Um, Mr. Sore, I am your follower on all your social media handles. I follow you on WhatsApp, Instagram, and what have you. In all your life, you have been uh, an activist, um, fully participated in NSAS protest, um, a, a promoter of revolution now, and also in some occasions you support uh, the, the agitation of Biafra. So my question is that, how will you ensure a secure Nigeria without creating social unrest and without violating human rights? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So the second question is from uh, Sado. Sado, please come forward. 
Good evening. My name is Sadio Banyo from University of Medjugorje. The presidential aspirant has addressed the issue of tertiary education. I would like to know what plans he has for the millions of out-of-school children in Nigeria, practical solutions that will bring the menace to an end, and also about insecurity. Several administrations have come and gone with policies and programs, but it's sad that insecurity is on the rise. So I would like to know what new strategies will you implement to cope insecurity? Thank you. And um, thank you. Thank you very much, University of Medjugorje. There are a few questions people have sent via email and Twitter, so I will add them to these questions and then you take it from there. Um, Ozu Emena says, do you believe the unity of Nigeria is negotiable? Valid question, given that from Medjugorje we've heard um, questions around Biafra. The same person also says the Nigeria Bureau of Statistics says about 133 million Nigerians are poor. How do you intend to lift more Nigerians out of poverty. Is yes. Right? So the first question is the same as the first one you read, which is the unity of Nigeria. And I think this is where people misconstrue the word unity, you know, as some kind of unbreakable bond for Nigeria. I need to give a little bit of historical background to Nigeria that Nigeria was not even put together by Nigerians. It was put together as a business by Lord Lugard. In fact, when Lugard was creating Nigeria, he had already created Port Harcourt. Mm. And the reason they created Port Harcourt was that they discovered coal in Enugu. So they needed to export the coal. And then Nigeria, Port Harcourt was created in 1912. Nigeria was created finally as one entity in 1914. So I am telling you that a country put together as a business did not become a nation. What are you killing yourself for? I believe that Nigeria can be united with justice. The Northerners are the most worried about the issue of unity. But if you look at the Northerners, they were actually the first to be reluctant mm. for a Nigerian independence I, because I, they I, felt I, like they were not I, I, ready. I, 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 think, yes. I think you will find that actually um, that's an assumption. It hasn't been tested. No, no. I'm, I'm saying it not, not to... No, no. It's, I'm just it's, saying it's, it's, it's an assumption. Maybe you can ask yes, your Yes. I'm not demeaning. The, no, what I'm saying is that they put a lot of thought into joining a united Nigeria. That's mm -hmm. why they delayed the independence for a few years. We would have had independence around 95, but the Northerners were not, they were thinking about it, they were yeah, consulting. The, 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 the so that's the point. So was that means that even at the onset, the people on that side of the divide had to be sure that they wanted to join Nigeria. So everybody that came to join Nigeria was forced into that unity. For us to now make the unity happen, we must create a perfect union. That's why I talk about the Constitution. Because that's what happened to Americans after the Brits, they defeated the Brits. They wanted a perfect union. Because at that time, there were blacks, women who were being oppressed. So, so the, the, the right to self-determination for you I is sacrosanct. I completely sacrosan believe in yes. the right. In fact, if we put it in our Constitution, the right to self-determination, Nigerian leaders will be more serious about governing Nigeria. So we, we should have some sort of mechanism that allows Absolutely. for a referendum. Absolutely. the reason I'm calling for... Yes. Is a fundamental right recognized by the United Nations. It's the reason I'm calling for a new constitution. Okay. So that Nigerians to, yeah. can put in that constitution. And I know that the people at which in Medjugorje, point could Nigeria decide uh, to challenge the unity of Nigeria through a referendum, not that it's just working. Violence, yeah. yeah. Okay, so violence. I mean, I know that University of Medjugorje questions are waiting, but um, we've got um, Ijoma in Enugu. And I just want us to go to her, and then you can combine all the questions together. We, can you hear hey, us? Um, City. Oh, from, uh, sorry, Ifoma. Hi. Hi. Good evening from Coal City. I'm Ifoma Ajimobi, live at Coal City University in Nugo. And the engagements have been quite insightful. Thank you for the platform once again. Uh, students have questions, plenty questions for the candidates. And we have Grace, Chiso, and Jonathan on standby with their questions. Jonathan, let's hear Jonathan's question. My name is Jonathan Annie from the Department of Microbiology. Sir, what do you intend to do about subsidy? We'll hear from subsidy. Summa right now. Summa. My name is Summa Woke from the Department of International Relations. 
Mr. Shore, it is not new to anybody that most public office holders have decided to send their children abroad to study. And for this reason, they are insensitive to the plight of an average Nigerian student caused by incessant strikes. Sir, as a former student union leader, how do you plan to put an end to these industrial actions, to these incessant industrial actions in public universities? Grace, please have a question. Oh, I thought we. Grace, we missed Grace. Oh, okay. All right. Praise. Praise. There's a lot of um, religious, and tri uh, religious and tribal agitations in our country today. Now, I want to know, most people, okay, sorry, most people actually feel um, maligned or, like, uh, slandered based on your belief. When you become president, or if you become president, what do you want to do about it? Curtis is also on standby. Curtis, let's have your question quickly. Okay. Final one from Enugu, and then we'll come back to the studio, please. Curtis. Hello, my name is Joshua Curtis DK Jr. So um, my question is to you, sir. If elected, what will you do differently in the areas of extrajudicial killings, especially those committed by the Nigerian police and our armed forces? Uh, we know of the SARS um, era, the things that they do. What will you do differently that the current government hasn't done? And then also, how do you include young minds like my humble self into the governance and also make us able to make decisions for others who are young like us. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a whole bunch of yeah, questions. And to I didn't get hear someone, but I heard that of a okay, so lady. So we'll start with the ones you heard, yes. and then I will. We'll start that of a lady who was talking about what we we'll do to end the incessant strike, incessant strikes, and the fact that the rich people are sending their children at the expense of uh, those children of the poor abroad. See, this is something I know very well because I track this and uh, you are a journalist, we used to do this together. I track how much money, how much money is spent in sending children of the rich at the expense of the poor to school. You discover that an average son of a politically connected or a politically exposed person going to a school in the UK is spending over two, maybe 200,000 pounds a year, the big schools. And if you break that down to Naira, it could almost build a, a, a building, a structure that has over six classrooms that is of the highest standard. They are stealing it from you. That is why I said, as part of our policy, that whereas we have no right to stop anybody from sending their children to school abroad, but they also have no right to steal our money to send their children to school abroad. And as a result, those monies that are retained, we will use it to give study grants to students that are going to school in Nigeria. In Denmark, Norway, students are paid to stay in school to the point that sometimes when they are supposed to spend four years in, in school, they spend six because what, they don't want to go. What's the population of Denmark? No, no, eh? it's so, not talking about the population. The population of Nigeria is big. The problem is the population of the thieves, which is not big, but they are taking the biggest of our resources. So we want to stop that. Let everybody who can afford to send their children to school, send their children to school is your problem. But don't steal government funds to send your children to school and then prevent students okay. who are supposed to have access to their own national resources. Please take you note of stay at home. my follow-up question. And yes. the reason I will, I will ask it now is... And I wanted to answer I don't that, want you, that guy yes, that I said know, he wants I want, to be I don't want to interrupt in our government. Let him join our party. This is a youth party. No more ancestors in government when we win. <laughs> no more ancestors in government. Yeah. There are a few more questions I need you to deal with, and when you are done with them, perhaps come back and talk about how you deal with corruption, since yeah. you were talking about how to deal with the money. Okay, so somebody asked um, um, what your, uh, you know, whether you remove subsidy. Oh, subsidy. Yes. <laughs> I think we should stop calling it subsidy. Okay. That's maybe it will make it easier. Mm -hmm. That particular name has been uh, demonized. The subsidy they say we have in Nigeria is the subsidy of the oligarchs. The people who are importing petrol uh, alone, when you take crude out of Nigeria, 
crude after they say has the capacity to get a lot of products, including your hair shampoo. We take our own crude out. We go with a whole crude. When we are coming by, we are coming by with just gallons of petrol, kerosene, jet A1, and that's all. And we see petrol at nose. Our solution is to re repair our refineries. And before you shout, oh, Shawere has come again, you are helping one man in Lagos to but finish this, his But this government has already said that subsidy is going out in June, so presumably you don't disagree. I'm not taking, what I'm saying is that whatever the poor people of this country can enjoy from government, the only thing they enjoy will keep it. But we will not allow the oligarchs to add their own bill on top of it. Let me tell so you, be, kerosene is not subsidized. Yes. How is it that it's not giving us any palliative? Mm. Diesel is not subsidized. Why is it that we are, not retail, we are not getting anything in return for unsubsidized diesel? Mm. So they just criminalize and demonize subsidy as if you can't support your citizens. So, so, so you must, I'm not from you must, Nigeria. Let me, let me just yeah. put this in. I'm not a U.S. citizen, guys. Hear this out. While uh, COVID was going on, the U.S. government sent me to the checks. I was, not, I was in detention. They were sending me money. I'm not even their citizen. Is that not subsidizing your citizenry? Mm -hmm. Our own leaders, they were hiding palliatives. No, it's true. From the people, until the people went and liberated the palliatives in Jaws. <laughs> Did you not hear that? Okay, so, so we cannot keep saying that government does not subsidize. And, and, and government I, subsidizes and, and, everywhere. And, 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 In fact, the most Mr. subsidized Shawere, people in Nigeria yeah, are the elite, Mr. Shawere, the oligarchs. The problem is I'm not too sure that anybody here doesn't know what the problems are. I'm giving you, I'm saying I'm, so, 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 I'm talking about I'm what has happened. subsidy, but don't uh -huh. call it subsidy so that to make it look bad. Okay, so, so we I, must support I'm, our citizens who are vulnerable. There are 130, 130 million how, Nigerians your, who have been thrown into the poverty market. Way? How do you, how do you just treat them as if they are nobody. And I'm wondering why you focused on the Senate and not the House of Reps. And I'll, I'll tell you why. The Senate, unlike the House of Reps, ensures equal representation for every state. So every state has three senators, yes. not four, not five, you know? So everybody in the Senate, in terms of representation, is equal. Whereas House of Reps, there are variations which many people find unfair because they're driven by landmass, by population, by that sort of thing. So Kano State, you know, might have more legislators than, say, uh, Zamfara so State then let's or let's, Enugu State. Let's grab the House of Representatives then. Right. Yes, so you, because I was, I was trying to understand yes. why you chose Senate I, I, and not House of... We, this, this, we came to that conclusion because most of the people in the Senate don't even have any reason to be there. And our goal is to reduce the cost of government. And I was also add, apart from putting the legislative arm into size, because South Korea doesn't have a Senate, and they are doing well. Senegal doesn't have a Senate, and they are doing well. We also want to reduce a lot of baggages mm -hmm. in federal ministries, uh, departments, and agencies. For instance, I don't know any reason, any reason why Nigeria should have a minister and a minister of state. Mm -hmm. They are doing essentially the same job. Get rid of the minister of state, keep the minister. A lot of organizations have replicated duties. We wipe them well, out again, you know, and we... reduce, and, we, and this will have impact because we are looking about a compact government. We are not going to deny it. We are, I agree with you. I agree with you completely that we sh the cost of governance is too much and it's, it's very top heavy, and it includes the presidency. And I don't want to repeat it here that you know they have uh, a jet of fleet of, uh, I mean, a fleet of jets that. Buhari said he wanted to reduce, he just kept increasing it. So what we are saying is that the cost of governance is too, is too much. I even worry why any Nigerian president needs an asshole rock, which can be converted to a children's hospital. The president doesn't have a family that's huge enough to be living in that zoo, as they call an asshole rock, that is fenced in three places. Whereas if you go to the White House of the U.S., it doesn't have that many bedrooms. If you go to number 10 down the street, I don't know how many bedrooms are there, but there are not as many as number seven, one mm. building in Asso Rock. So I'm just using that as an analogy on how, how much we spend wasting our money doing so, nothing. So, 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 so presumably when you get in there yeah. to determine what should go and come, there would be some sort of process. Well, exactly. That's why I'm saying that the constitution needs to change. For instance, if we don't change the constitution, we can't scrap. You look at the beautiful argument you presented now about the House of Rep. We have just put them in trouble. Now we are going to be thinking no, about no, no, scrapping no, no, them. No, 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 no
wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't presenting it to make an argument. I was just trying to understand the business because the House of, let me tell idea. you the advantage that they have that the Senate doesn't have yeah. is that they are also where you find minorities that are never represented anywhere. So well, communities... Well, one of the arms have to go. Right? That's okay. in our view. We, 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 yeah. we are running fast out of time. So let me take a quick break so that when we come back, we take a few more remote locations and we try and wrap up this conversation. You are watching the candidates. These are the candidates of the AAC, uh, Mr. Ele Showere and Malam Magashi. Don't go away. Media in association with Cabal Entertainment presents The Candidates, a presidential town hall meeting series where the presidential candidates of the six leading political parties tell us about their plans for the country. Join Kadaria Ahmed as she leads us into the world of these candidates from the 17th to the 23rd of November 2022. This very important program will be streamed on FRCN, Radio Now, DSTV, NTA, Facebook, YouTube, and more. This is a town hall meeting you shouldn't miss. Tune in. Let's hear from the candidates. Welcome back. You are watching The Candidates. And um, we're going straight to the University of Abuja, where Ruth is on standby. And please note, we can only take two questions. And if you can keep them tight, we really would appreciate it, because we're running fast out of time. Yeah, at the University of Abuja, I must say it's been an interesting conversation there with the AAC candidates. The students are excited to ask some questions, and like you said, we'll take just two. So I'm starting with um, Kuram Sokoja. Kuram? Hello, good evening. I'm Kuram Sokoja from Economics Department. My question is, in view of the present state of economic recession, inflation, the degradation of the NERA, and balance of trade deficits, what are the steps you want to take as incoming president to solve all these alarming issues that has brought about economic breakdown? Secondly, in consideration that we practice the Keynesian economic system, as to the fact that governments play a key role in, the, in controlling the forces of demand and supply and market participation, what are the steps you have to put in place to improve government's functionality in major sectors of the economy, such as production, industry sector? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, that's quite a handful. Rafael, it's next. Rafael. Yeah, good evening. My name is Echobo Rafael Ikweben. Uh, my question is, um, if um, and when you are uh, elected as president, what are, what, what are the steps you are going to take to raise Nigerians' confidence in government, as a, um, an average Nigerian has lost total confidence in, in government and governance and the ability to, um, to ensure and provide basic responsibility, um, to um, perform their basic responsibilities of theirs and met, which include are not limited to social amenities, security of life and properties and, and all that, et cetera, et cetera. Thank, thank you very much, University of Abuja. And because we have two other universities, so we don't get confused. If you dive straight into those answers, keep them short, and then we take the other universities. <clears throat> the first question is, you know, the amount of intervention governments can get. So into the economy the keeps econ coming yeah, up so, again and again. And uh, government has a duty uh, to manage the microeconomic policy of the country. And when we say the we also have a duty to ensure that our monetary policy is tight. I mentioned it when we started that Nigeria's central bank is just a glorified, you know, bureau de change right now. We will so, change that when we come in to ensure that we have a central bank team, not just a government, who understands what the monetary kind of policy we need to stabilize the Naira in particular. But it does need to be independent, so you in won't interfere. Independence, it's what, that's what I'm saying. Gov the, the government has a role to play in taxation. It has a role to play in generating revenue. The central bank is the bank to the government. 
Yes, in, yes, that's that's what, what that's that, that's that's what the central bank is practically about. This the independence we are talking about. Central bank supposed to drive uh, monetary exactly. policy. Exactly, they are supposed to drive monetary based policy. Based on the sort of what is supposed the, to be yeah, best for the economy. Yeah, they are supposed to be in charge of rates, you know, and uh, the the things that can help your currency be solid, and have purchasing power, and have you know its ability. To, you know, they also control our foreign exchange uh, processes and foreign reserves. But government cannot just say, well, the central bank is independent but, but, to the but, point but that the you forget. of this central bank yes. and the reasons that many believe they got it wrong is that actually they were too close to government. It's true. Uh, it's That's so, what I'm so, saying so. is BDC now. If you know the central bank governor, you can just get okay. dollar in the money. Again, I can't be sued, though. So I'll come to you and why collect why you, money. Why are you are talking to a fellow <laughs> journalist like okay. yourself? Let's, let's, let's carry on. So answering yeah. that question so, on the economy. So what I mentioned earlier, that in all of this, one calculation that people don't make when it comes to Nigeria they eliminate completely or refuse to discuss standard of living. All of this, mm. fiscal policy, monetary policy, all kinds of policies are supposed to make life better for the citizens. And that is where the conversation about purchasing power parity comes in. What is it that if I want to buy this shirt in the US as a cost? And what will it cost me in terms of Naira to buy in the, in the country? If I'm not producing it, it doesn't matter whether I like it or not, it costs me more because my currency is weak. Okay, so and there was a question sort yes. of related to that, which was about productivity. Yes, but at so, the moment, but we're you not can't a get, see, you can't get into product. You can't have a production argument in Nigeria without fixing the power sector, the energy sector. Mm. And that is why I keep discussing how to bring light and discuss about energy and energy transition and to look at a variety of energy sources and how we can be a real participant in international market for Mala these Magashik, products. Can you take the question on confidence and um, how you can rebuild confidence in governance and government, given what, where we are today? To be brief, what do the people want from the government? If they get what they want or what they desire or what they expect, they have confidence. They need peace, security, justice, social amenities, and what have you. So if we are in government, we would ensure that all the, uh, let me get back to something legal, all the provisions of Chapter 2 of the Nigerian Constitution are provided to the citizens. If the citizens have a food to eat, have a shelter, have an education, they won't need anything and they would respect the government that supply that. So it's a question of basically if the government keeps the side of the bargain, Certainly the contract that is between so, citizens. Yeah, that's social okay. contracts. I have to go now quickly to the University of Ibadan and Nero is joining us. Hello, Nero. Good evening. Good evening, Kadoya. I hope you can hear us now. Yes, at last. Happy to see your face <laughs> and to hear, hear your voice. All, all evening. Anyways, a very interesting conversation there and I'm going to go straight to the point. Uh, we have two questions uh, from the University of Ibadan right here. And I have, uh, first up, Odion. Odion, step up for the question. Okay, good evening. My name is Odion Sani ABIA. I'm an electrical engineering student from the University of Ibadan. Um, first of all, um, some might argue that the last time Nigeria was this divided was um, before the civil war. I mean, that's in the religious and the ethnic sense. Now, you said something about um, those who want to break out of Nigeria can seek legal means. But how did you, Shori, want to promote unity in Nigeria? That's the first question. And the second question is, um, in recent times, we've seen a lot of um, thousands of um, Nigerian healthcare workers travel out of the country for greener pastures. And reports even show that the ratio of doctors to patients in Nigeria is 1 to 9,000. So how do you um, plan to um, combat this problem? So do you want to carry out um, healthcare reform? And how do you want to go about that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, and uh, the second question is coming from Olajuwon. Olajuwon. That would be the third question. Um, first and foremost, I would like to state that um, talk is cheap. Um, most of the questions, most of your answers to the questions have not been quite specific. So I will implore you to be very specific in my, que in my um, questions to you now. For instance, you were asked how you were going to stop um, stealing of subsidy. But you didn't quite give an answer. You just said they know, they, we know they're out of business once you're in. How exactly do you plan to get them out of business, knowing fully where their corruption fights back? And again, I will move quickly to, to edu education. I'd like to know how exactly you're going to prevent the recurrence of um, 
as we strike in very, in very specific, very specific terms. And if you become the president of Nigeria, Mr. Shoure, what would be your stance on uh, no work, no pay, as the federal government of Nigeria is stating now? Because it is very clearly stated in the Constitution, in the Trade Dispute Act, that um, government might decide not to pay workers who do not, do not work. And again, very quickly, Mr. Shoure, on climate change, President Muhammadu Buhari has said that he's going to, um, he's going to, he's calling for more urgent investment um, for facilities in Africa. What exactly? Is your, is your stance on climate change. And last but not the least... Ah, and last, but not, and last but not the least, last but not ah. the least, what exactly is the economic policy? What okay. is your money policy? What exactly is your fiscal policy? Please, our appreciative... Okay. Very, very, I, I, Neva, I'm afraid... Thank you very much for that. Um, with less than 15 minutes to go, can I urge you to be really short with your answers? Yeah. And I can prompt you one by one again if you want. <laughs> Maybe so you can prompt me, yeah. Yes. Um, how would you promote unity? You've said you believe in the right to self-determination, but if you are president, how will you promote unity? Well, you know, if you give justice to all the sectors, nobody will want out of Nigeria. So, you see, people talk a lot about Biafra, you know. They also forget that the Yorubas also have their own agitators. Uh, there are people in the Middle East, there are Middle um, Mid, middle belt, middle belt who, are, who, are, who also want out of Nigeria. Yeah. But what people have never talked about is that a lot of Nigerians have actually mentally seceded from Nigeria. Mm. How do you calculate? How do you... The Jaqua syndrome yeah. is because of people have seceded. Okay, they are, so Jaqua, only people who are trapped healthcare. Yes. This is straight into the next question. So what's your next question? Then? Healthcare. healthcare. Said, with doctors leaving and all of that, what's exactly. your plan so for solving So what healthcare? we need to do specifically is to invest in healthcare. And I have said it. We need to have a healthcare system that accommodates all. And it is not socialism, it's the right thing to do, How? it's compulsory, it's investment. You have to invest a sizable amount of your budget or, in, or revenue in ensuring that hospitals are working, okay, drugs so, so are available, sort of you have an is insurance, it? our is insurance. insurance policy, okay, okay. but it's not the one that's going to be exploited or stolen by, you know, true fake HMOs. Okay, so at the moment, there's a new health care act that mm. the president has, you know, brought into law, which makes it completely compulsory for every person who, you know, um, employs more than anything from five up to provide health care for their person. And if you're an artisan, you're also by law supposed to go and sign on to some sort of HMO. What will you do differently from what already exists? I think it should be the duty of government, our government, to provide health care for all. Okay. And not leave health care to employers whose, who the burden of health care provision might force them to either be forging the number so of employees. So you would be yes, finding the money. Yes, we still have a contributory... You know, system to aid for employers, of course. But it won't be such that you ask employers to take over the entire health care of their workers. What about when the employers then fall out of business? Who takes care of the, the employees? The person from Ibadan that said talk is cheap is not satisfied about the specificity of your answers. He said, for example, how are you going to stop them from stealing? Um, especially since we know corruption fights back yeah. um, traditionally. He's also asked you to discuss the ASU issues and um, whether you, you respect this idea of people don't get paid um, unless no, they actually No, I don't respect the people. And, and all of when, that. when the strike is just, yes. you have to pay the strikers. It's not, they didn't want to do this. It was government that forced them to. If you want to start stopping the pay of people who are not working, I think the president will be number one because he barely work. Uh, it is true. Yes. So, and the the truth is that these are things that escalate the problems. You can't keep escalating the problem by engaging in things that make our higher institutions are too important to be played with with technical parts of laws. Let's put the money they ask for. They are specific about how much they want. Let's find the money and give it to them. And make but, sure but their demands go beyond money. There are seven demands okay. that ASU is making oh, yeah. of the And Nigerian the demands have been the same since the 90s. Yeah, because I was, was in the University, was the university of Lagos when, you know? when Jega was so, president so of ASU. So you wouldn't rethink education at all, like some people are saying, um, create a situation where you know, universities become independent, they are able to get endowments. And, you know, education is too important. Be, because this, this, let me in other places thing. where education works, yeah. education is not as cheap as it is in Nigeria. 
education. So people actually, is, we, we, not, if you look at how much we pay it's, it's to not train as doctors. As, it's, it's, not in, it's not also as expensive as they think. In the 90s, the IMF and the World Bank came to this country and said, don't invest in education. It's too expensive. It's waste. Let people pay for their education. But the same people okay. came back and recruited 8,000 doctors from the education they didn't want us to invest in okay. in 1990. You, uh, you so this is hypocrisy. Victor you cannot compare is on education to anything. By Elsa, yes. And I don't really want to waste their time because they're the last um, school we're going to. But you still haven't talked about, you know the thieves, yes, who are stealing the subsidy, yes, but talk is cheap. How do you I'm intend not, to I'm not, fight I don't them? belong to the category of talkies. If the student, he should go and do research about me at the University of Lagos. I'm not a talkies cheap person. Okay. Let's go to Victor, who is, at, uh, who is in Bielsa, and, and join our last remote site, because they've been very patient. They've been listening. Thank you, Kadaria. Very interesting conversation there at the studio, and it has sparked a lot of comments here at Bielsa Center. We have uh, two questions that will be asked. I'll call on Honorable Elio Fasuno to ask the first question, then we'll move to Honorable Anawe. Yeah, good evening. I am Honorable Chief of Hospice, Elio Fasuno, the former legislator. Kindly answer this question. Without a big occasion, the bulk of the wealth of our country comes from the crude oil in the Nanja Delta region. And for donkey years, the entire environment, I mean the ecosystem, has been abysmally polluted, disadvised, defaced, disintegrated, and bastardized. And the people impoverished with the oil blocks predominantly in the hands of people outside the region. Should you become the next president, how would you redress this repugnant imbalance? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll, 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 we'll take one more question quickly, please. Okay, good evening. My name is Amarui, Ukuke Metro Park, Public Servant. First and foremost, I want to congratulate the candidates for putting himself forward. It's not easy. I feel that uh, the right time has come for good people. They only put themselves forward. Briefly, my question if you become the president, what will you do with the presidential legacy program? But recently, the news is everywhere that this government has decided to wind down the presidential legacy program on assets support without the government keeping it inside of the packaging. And this is causing a lot of problems in the Niger Delta. So, what will you do with the presidential legacy program? Thank you. Thank you. And Victor, if Thank I could ask you, Victor, can I ask you to quickly recap that second question? Because it wasn't very audible. We could barely hear him. Okay. The, the, the second question by Alawi says that um, the amnesty program by the federal government, there are news that, uh, that it will be um, stopped very soon without any proper plan. If um, Mr. Sowore becomes the president, of Nigeria, what are his plans on the issue of the amnesty program? Okay, so thank you very much, Victor. Two quick questions. The Niger Delta produces the bulk of the wealth. They pay, you know, the highest price, no development. What are your plans on redressing that imbalance? And on the issue of the amnesty program, what I'll is start with the amnesty to? program. I think it's uh, being called a cesspool of corruption, uh, but I, like the program, and I would develop it, develop into a concrete. So you like the principle of yeah, it? Yes, I it like the principle for? of it, uh, because it brought peace to the Niger Delta. But <coughs> that peace. peace cannot last on the basis of this ad hoc uh, intervention in Niger Delta. The amount of money you are giving to Amnesty can be used to build universities that will train lots of Niger Deltans. Uh, locally. It, locally. Mm -hmm. And you could have finished the roads, the uh, east-west highway that has now been washed away. It, a lot of development could have come from that. What I would agitate for is for the Niger Delta region to get a larger portion of the oil resources. So to that extent, you can say that I'm uh, biased on the side of resource control. But anybody that is listening to me today should know that the word resource is dynamic. So if one day 
the northern part of Nigeria is producing solar energy electricity for the rest of the country. Don't come and tell me that they don't have a right to also get a part of that resource. If what I seem to be hearing you saying is that you are not quite hundred percent how to deal with this issue, and you are still thinking it through. What are you talking about? You think uh, it's dynamic? I'm, I'm, I'm from the Niger Delta. Do you know no, that? I know. Yeah, so I could have qualified as a militant. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I don't understand the problems. You see, words? because part of what we should understand here mm. is that problems that are well understood. She's, there's no reason for us to be parading any level of intelligence that I'm not the solutions to Niger Delta for a lot of Nigeria, but it's not a thing you can resolve on a TV interview for two hours. You know, mm -hmm. with regards to those who say be specific. If you want to see specific, ask for manifesto. We have manifesto online, by the way, on Showred uh, 2020. And by the way, some of your manifesto issues seem to be at odds with your personal issues. So page 32 of your manifesto, for example, um, they, they talk extensively about carrying people along in order to get things done. But when we listen to you sometimes, we almost feel like no, it's you not are true. marching at it alone. No, because no, you no, think no, no, you no. alone the, can the, do it. The fact that I'm passionate about how fast Nigeria should have developed doesn't mean that I don't carry people along. I believe in people. I'm, I've been on the side of the masses. The injuries I've suffered the most have suffered because even when I could have been comfortable, I come back to take on battles with others. So you can't claim that we don't carry people along when we organize some of the okay, biggest Okay, we have just about from time to time. five minutes to go. So I want to ask one final question of you and then use the remaining three minutes, if you answer it quickly, to allow you to wrap up and sort of give your final message to the electorate. Um, I noticed that when you set up the party AAC in yeah. sort of 2018, you started out as chairman, then you became the presidential candidate and therefore had to step down as chairman. You lost elections and then became chairman again of the party. Yeah. And you've now stepped down again to run for the elections. How come? Is it that there aren't people qualified enough to chair your party? Because the, the, the optics of it look like this is a show worry party as opposed to sort of something that encompasses a diversity of people, if you keep moving from chairman to presidential candidate and back again? I'm glad you asked, and I want to answer you directly. We set up a party in 2018, and we sort of decided in, in agreement with INEC that we'll have interim leaders as, until we go to a convention. And the convention of the party was supposed to happen after the 2019 election, because we didn't have much time. before when it, the election was over, the party was hijacked. Yes, we, yes. we didn't get a chance to enter into all so that So we couldn't go to convention. Right. And I was arrested when we were protesting against and going to court about it. And there was no opportunity to do any election until we won in the Court of Appeal on June 2nd. So when we won, elections were six days away. We had to run around the country to set up. That's why I stepped down again. As soon as this election is over, we will go to a proper convention, and I promise I'm not going to contest as party chairman again. Okay. Literally in 30 seconds, Marlon Mageshi, a final opportunity to speak to Nigerians, the electorate, and tell them why the duo of you and Mr. Showeri represent the best option for Nigeria. I will urge Nigerians to read our manifesto. There is something very important that we have not talked, but we don't have a time. Something that is uh, sticking on the nope of the northern part of Nigeria, that is the Almajiri system, we have a very vast, versatile and workable uh, framework for the Almajiri system to work. I assure the northerners that if we get into power, there would not be Almajiri that would be begging. We would separate that aspect of Almajiri, that is studying religious uh, Big knowledge there. and the begging. Yeah, Mr. Shore, uh, 30 seconds, your final words to the electorate. You know the meaning of Almajiri is somebody who it's travels to seek knowledge, yes. not somebody who begs. Yes. Yeah. So he's very clear on that. But Nigerians have seen the difference. I'm glad that I ran in 2019, and I wish you elected me and did not select somebody who didn't win the election to lead you. This time around, we're looking forward to credible free and fair elections, and we hope having heard from us, those of you who are undecided, that you know who the right person is to lead this country to liberty. We want Mr. to put liberty Yenye. 
on the ballot. Ms. Ayelesha Ware and Alan Gagashi, thank you so much for joining us.